Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second day of uh, Learning for Dynamics and Control. We have a wonderful uh, lineup of speakers uh, for today as well. And we'll start with none other than Claire Tomlin from UC Berkeley, who is going to talk to us about safe learning in robotics. Yeah, thank you very much. A, pl a pleasure to be here. Thanks to the organizers for this um, amazing, um, both at the CDC last year and, and yesterday and today, organization of, of bringing together people for this, this community. Um, it's, an, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk about our work in the perspective of safety and safe learning. And um, safety is a perspective that, that we've had in my group for a long time. We've very, been very concerned with aerospace systems and safety in robotics. And um, several years ago, we worked on taking a kind of safety computation that we are, um, uh, have been working on a lot in our, our group, in Hamilton's Jacoby Reachability, and integrating into that um, a learning mechanism. So here on the left, we're pre-computing a control invariant set of a nominal model of this system using Hamilton Jacobi reachability. And then um, in online, we're selecting an appropriate level set of that function to use as a safety envelope as we're updating the model. So in this case, there's a wind disturbance, and uh, the nominal model doesn't include that wind disturbance. It significantly affects the behavior of the quadrotor in the lower part of the room. And as the, as the vehicle is flying around in its safe envelope, and it detects that it's got this wind disturbance, it scales back that envelope to a, um, to a, a level set which is safe for the measurements that it's capturing. And we're using a Gaussian process model for that. So um, this was work actually when Melanie was at Berkeley. She worked on this. It was uh, Melanie that really brought um, the, the work around Gaussian processes to our group. Um, in a sense, though, these are well-behaved disturbances. So you've got a, a, a nominal model, and the, the actual model is some variation of that where the disturbances come in as some function, and that function is fairly well-behaved to be able to prove something about safety of the actual system. So what we're actually interested in, and when we're thinking about integrating learning into control, are these challenging scenarios where those disturbances are not well behaved. So um, for example, when the systems are trying to understand what people in the neighborhood are doing. And so uh, Anka spoke yesterday about our work in predicting human behavior and then planning um, for safe robot motion around that. Um, Sylvia and David, who uh, worked on this with some others, are here um, in the meeting today. And also unknown environments. So um, the system is um, navigating. It's got a camera or other sensors. And it's interested in being able to navigate safely, yet it's observing the environment often for the first time and has to react safely to the, the things that it observes. So these are typo, typical situations where you don't have this kind of well-behaved disturbance coming into the vector field where you can prove properties about safety of the overall system. Um, so I'm going to talk today about two things. The first is, in the context of that last example, um, how do we start to think about navigating safely when we're using a real perception module in the loop? And, um, and how do we you know, even design an architecture for planning? And then secondly, how do we then think about safe navigation? So taking that architecture and um, moving towards making it safe. OK, so this first project is um, a project that is led by Samuel Bansal, who's also here. And um, it's a collaboration between our group and uh, Jitendra Malik's computer vision group. We really felt that it was important to use the best uh, computer vision algorithms um, that one would use for perception in a robotic navigation problem. Um, and we, we kind of have this, this example that you'll see throughout the talk, which is you have a robot, and you'd like to efficiently um, navigate that robot from using a camera or some other um, kind of camera-like sensors of its environment from its known position where it is now to a known goal in an unknown environment. 
Okay, and our environments are, we say they're unknown, but they're basically, um, you know, academic, inside academic buildings. The architecture, and, and here I really resonate with what Angela said yesterday and presented about the importance of thinking carefully about architectures when you're integrating perception and or learning-based perception or any significant learning module in the loop. Um, the architecture is that we've been developing and promoting is one which is modular. So perception, planning, and control. I think this seems normal to a control audience that we would actually bring, separate those, the perception and then planning and control. Um, I don't think it's normal in, um, in the learning community. In fact, there's been a lot of success in end-to-end -end learning, and that is you know, something that we're interested in comparing an architecture like this to. So this is, this is the architecture that we developed. It's got a perception module which takes images so that's from the onboard camera on the robot and feeds that into um, a, a neural network, which also takes um, information about the goal and the current inertials of the robot and then provides a waypoint, the next waypoint for the, the vehicle to go to. So that waypoint is something concrete. It's something that, you know, again, in control, we're kind of used to that. We get a waypoint, then that can be fed into a planning uh, module and then fed into a control. And we're using fairly standard planning here. Um, we're um, using, a, well, we developed a, a spline-based planner, and for control, we're using LQR, so linearizing the dynamics of the vehicle, which we know, so they're not very complicated, four-dimensional dynamics around those spline-based trajectories. The, the hard part here is the developing the perception module, and this is where um, we spent the most time. Um, in, in training that module so that when the system is presented with unknown environments, it behaves in a way that you would efficiently, it's safe, um, it uh, navigates efficiently towards the goal. Um, we, in developing this, we used uh, simulated databases for training. So Stanford makes available um, an indoor space as a 3D, basically textured mesh set of um, indoor environments over about five indoor spaces in three buildings. We used two of those buildings for training, and then we, used, um, we held out the, the third building for test environments, so we, we, we split those. Um, in training the module, we used optimal control. And so it's a supervised learning um, mechanism that we're using, where in training, um, from those databases, the location and the shape of the obstacles are known, um, and we develop a cost function, which is essentially a sign distance function away from the obstacles and towards the goal. And then the, um, the, the, base, the, the goal of that um, optimal control algorithm is to find a waypoint such that the resulting spline minimizes that cost. Um, to evaluate this um, and to compare it to other architectures, we, uh, we also developed an end-to-end, -end, um, well, we used a, an architecture that had been developed, a popular architecture for end-to-end -end learning, where we also trained using exactly the same data, but instead of going from image to waypoint in that case, we're training from image to control action. So the end-to-end -end learning is trained with smooth control commands, which is generated from our expert um, trajectory using optimal control. Uh, okay, so um, if we then take a look at the the results, and, and this is sort of earlier this year, we started to get better results after you know, iterating on the architectures and a lot of lessons learned, which I'll mention. Um, if we look at our model based versus end-to-end, -end, we're getting a, a pretty significantly larger success rate in actually reaching the goal. And then if you take those scenarios which were successful for both, and you look at some of the other metrics, like the time to reach the goal, the average acceleration along the trajectory, and the average jerk along the trajectory, things that you're really interested in for control, it's also doing significantly better. And if you look at the kind of cases where you know, a model-based technique um, uh, 
reaches the goal, whereas an end-to-end -end doesn't, they're typically cases where um, to be able to maneuver, you require tight control commands around corners, for example. So here we start off at the blue dot, the goals are the green dots. Now these are environments that, simulated environments that we're now testing that already trained architecture on. And, um, and again, looking at the control profile, the, as you would kind of expect from this architecture, the, um, the control profile for model-based is significantly less jerky, and you get kind of nice, smooth um, commands. So let's just take a look at a couple of these results. Um, and it's important to note that the robot is only seeing the first-person view. So the robot has the camera. All it sees is what's on the left. We're just showing the top view and that kind of third-person view so you can see these experimental scenarios. And this is um, taking that neural net, which was trained only using simulated data, and applying it directly on the robot. So there's no, um, we didn't use any data from this uh, real-world environment. It was trained at Stanford, and we're letting it run at Berkeley. So kind of a different, um, you know, still in an office building, but a different, a different, a, a real-world environment. Um, so it, it's... It's using that network to recognize um, the sort of environment. It has to go around chairs, uh, tables to get to the goal. Here's a case where um, the goal is to, to actually get to the goal safely. It has to go through a door, so it has to recognize that you know what a door is. So there's um, some component, some component of semantics learning that, of course, the neural net captures. And so it's able to come out of the room and maneuver towards the goal. Even, you know, as it comes out of the room, there's some significant glare. We didn't have to train for glare. So, you know, that's the kind of generalization that has been observed in end-to-end um, -end learning that we wanted to try to capture in this model-based learning paradigm. And even though we trained it using, and we're, um, we're working in static environments, uh, we, asked, um, we asked it to now uh, reach a goal where the environment is changing. And, you know, as you might expect, if the dynamics of the environment are sort of comparable or slower to the dynamics of the actual vehicle, you can, um, you can get to goal. So here's Varun um, maneuvering the chairs around so that it's, uh, you know, it's forced to maneuver around those chairs to get to the goal. Okay, so some lessons learned here. Um, the, the data representation is very important. So uh, after going back and forth, we ended up using a data representation in the egocentric frame of the robot. So the goal representation is in the egocentric frame, the, um, the, 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 the frame that the robot is kind of, is sort of matched to the images that the robot's actually seeing. Um, optimal control can be too optimal. So as we know, you know, if we're optimizing, it likes to skirt corners. Um, that's a problem. Again, that's fairly intuitive. We would bloat our obstacles a little bit um, to be able to, when you know, this, this uh, neural network is being used in actual environments, we're not always hitting the corners of tables and chairs. Um, that waypoint, the, the way we kind of capture the information about this navigation task in the environment and translate that interface between perception, between perception and control, that representation of the waypoint is very important. It's going to be some probably collapsed set of states of the system and how you, you know, what you use, whether in this case it's a fairly simple four-dimensional model, you know, whether we just use position or whether we use position and heading makes a big difference. Again, it's intuitive when we think about it afterwards, but actually thinking about now if we want to take this module and apply it on a walking robot, as we're doing now at Berkeley, that's a very high-dimensional system. What are the important waypoints to use? What, what, how do we conceptualize that model when we think about this collapse of perception passing it forward to planning and control. Um, other things we learned just by working with uh, amazing computer vision colleagues, um, it's uh, basically always now the case that you'd build on existing neural network architectures. We tried out a bunch. What you saw in these results was a ResNet 50 architecture. Uh, it's a convolutional neural net. Um, the, um, the structure of that is it's a pre-trained network. So this is typically what one would start with and then train on top of that. Um, 
It's, it was very important, again, intuitively, to include image and perspective distortions during training. Um, and interestingly, if we took the results and then we applied a reinforcement learning on top of that, the results got worse. Um, that's something that we're investigating, but it's, it's, it's actually very interesting to consider, you know, when we think about moving away from supervised learning, it becomes very interesting to think about what, how, how we do that, what are the correct steps to take. Okay, so, um, so we, we were getting some good results and happy about that, but there's, of course, cases where the, the system fails. This is just a case, again, we applied this from training and simulation to um, uh, using it in the real world, and uh, maybe Berkeley's chairs are a little bit different from Stanford's chairs, but it just, you know, it hit the, it hit the obstacle, and then, and then so that was over. So the second part in these last um, few minutes, I'm going to talk about um, how we kind of wrap a, a safety, um, um, a, an envelope, a control invariant set around, um, around a planning module. I mean, this is one planning module or any kind of planning module in robotics. Um, and, and here, you know, the, the fact that we're operating in unknown environments presents some challenges for safety, of course. We want to be safe despite the fact that obstacles may be unseen. So these have, you know, realistic onboard sensors with fields of view. Um, the, the, um, the field of view changes depending on what kind of sensor you're using. For example, a camera or a LIDAR, we'd like to be able to have a, an architecture that works depending for, for different sensing architectures. Um, and when we're working with safety, as we all know, we're, um, we're dealing with computationally challenging problems. How do we compute those safety envelopes in real time? And, and, um, and so that, that kind of is the background behind um, this next piece of work, which um, again involves Samuel and Andrea Baichi um, and, uh, um, and a couple of other students in the group. Okay, so just going back to the, the robotic uh, example here, again, we have a model, well, you know, it's, it's realistic to assume we have a, a model of the system that we designed um, with uh, probably some disturbances that are unmodeled, um, some control inputs, so in this case, disturbances affect the, the velocities, um, and we're using um, angular and linear acceleration, angular velocity and linear acceleration as control inputs. Okay, so, so now if we knew the environment and we knew the obstacle map, um, this, is, this is what we would do. We would create a representation of what is obstacle and what is free space. Um, and then we would use that representation. So here's um, kind of that representation uh, more stylistically. Um, in the position space, um, just a top view, the gray represents the obstacles and the white is the free space. Okay, and so, and so thinking about safety, now this goes back to the old uh, optimal control and dynamic games. Um, we represent, in terms of obstacle and free space, we represent those states which are safe, which are free of obstacles, as being super level sets of a, of a function, L of X. So those states um, that are, uh, that are going to be obstacles are those states x, or uh, are contained in those states x, such that this function L of x is less than or equal to 0. So we can come up with that, for example, a sine distance function. Um, and then we use a, a cost, which represents, for a particular state x, future rewards or penalties that are going to be incurred if the system starts at state X and applies control input U with the environment applying disturbance input D. And so that's basically going to be that function L evaluated along the ensuing trajectory of that dynamic system. And since we're interested in safety, we're going to take the minimum over time. Right, because we're minimizing that function L, and negative represents unsafe. Okay, so we can um, sort of picture that. Here's a state X um, that for our dynamic system. You know, control, um, despite you know, the best control input, the disturbances might be pushing it in a certain way, which causes trajectories. In this case, both trajectories, at some point along that time horizon, enter that unsafe region, and, um, and so those states, that state should be labeled unsafe if that's the best control effort. Okay, so this is really the background behind reachability. 
um, we develop a value function, which now says, okay, so we're, um, we assume we can apply at the safety boundary the best control input, the, the, the input U that maximizes that value function. Um, we don't know what the disturbance is going to do, typically within some bounds, and so the disturbance we assume is going to minimize, it's gonna to try to make that system unsafe, um, and um, we minimize that, that cost function um, over time, as we said. So the disturbance, the other thing that's interesting here is it's a game. The control plays first because the disturbance gets the advantage of seeing what the control has just played. So that information architecture is also interesting. Okay, so this is a, there's a long history, a lot of people in this audience who contributed towards this concept of reachability for safety, going back to uh, Dimitri Bertsekas and Ian Rhodes' paper back in the 70s on reachability for discrete state systems. Um, and, and so we've been working on this for a long time. We've uh, developed a toolbox. So here's that toolbox applied. You can see the, the reachable set computed um, based on taking that value function and iterating using a hamilton jacobi isaacs iteration. Okay, so then that reachable set becomes the uh, sub-zero level sets of the computed value function, and from that you can also compute the optimal control to apply on the boundary to keep you inside the safe set. Okay, so if you look at the white region, the inside that red region is actually the safe region. And so it's sort of, in this case, you know, this is a four-dimensional system that's been projected down into, uh, into the two position dimensions, but you can sort of see intuitively for that system, if we look at this slice here, which is shown for um, the angle theta just being pi by two, so pointing straight upwards and a positive velocity, this state is on the boundary because if the robot were in that configuration on the boundary and it were pointing and going at positive velocity, it would go right into the obstacle. So there's some intuition as to how that set shrunk back away from the boundary where, for example, that point is safe in that configuration because the robot's already moving away from the boundary. Okay, so now we want to apply that to um, this robotic system. We've got that safe set boundary that we've pre-computed. Um, and it can also give us the safe control action that we want to apply, but now we're operating, of course, in an environment where we don't know the obstacle map a priori. We just get updates from the sensors on board about what we're seeing, and um, from that we want to infer what the obstacle map is. Um, so we, um, we've been looking at, as I said, a couple of different sensor modalities. Um, the camera that's on board the robot that we're testing with, but also a LiDAR, which has a more, um, a field which is, is sort of more like a circle around the robot. And so basically the architecture takes the field of view. I mean, if, if, if we were looking at a simple scenario where the obstacle is just shown in gray here, the goal is again green, um, and the field of view is blue, um, since it doesn't see anything outside its field of view, we're going to start by assuming that everything's an obstacle and um, it computes the backwards reachable set from that obstacle, and then it starts to maneuver within its safe set, gets a new field of view, looks at where the obstacles are. Again, now it's seen more, and so it creates a map of free space. Again, assuming that nothing's changing. This is static in the environment that it's already seen, and then we can iterate and compute that safe set. So here's that filter applied to, um, this is just that same environment, and we're just using here a, an RRT robotic planner. So this is kind of a module that you could fit with any robotic planner. Um, and you could kind of see, as it, as it comes close to the edge of the um, reachable set, the optimal control for reachability is applied to push it away from that unsafe region. Um, how do you apply this in real time now? Reachability is a, you know, you grid up the state space, you compute this value function, it's subject to the curse of dimensionality. So in my group, um, especially quite recently, we've been working on a number of mechanisms for doing this computation in real time. And the idea is to pre-compute a set and then update that set in real time, always maintaining the conservativeness of that safety approximation. And we've worked on two methods, warm starting, which uses, um, instead of reinitializing at every case, we use that pre-computed value function as an initialization for the next um, iteration of the Hamilton-Jacobi computation. 
and then also um, local updates. So that means that, um, and this is actually the real-time savings, you're only really needing to compute an update to that value function where, um, where you're getting you know, new information about the value, where the value function is changing. Okay, so we put that into, again, it could go into any planning module. So we fit it into ours. It comes in as the safety verifier that comes out of the LQR controller. And so that same scenario that we saw um, at the... Um, at the beginning of this section where the robot would, um, without the safety boundary, um, potentially hit the obstacle. It's now using that iterated computation of the reachable set. Again, the robot is only seeing the, um, the robot point of view, um, but we're showing the others just so you can visualize it um, to be able to reach the goal. Okay, so, so to summarize, um, we have been working on I think a very practical scenario of, you know, what is the what is the sort of top the the best in computer vision for um, navigating robots and incorporating that into the into the control loop. Um, we developed an algorithm for supervising learning using optimal control, which provided a perception planning and control pipeline. We applied it to this vision-based navigation task and we've compared it to a bunch of other architectures, including a more traditional SLAM pipeline. Um, and, and the second part we talked about is basically how would we develop a mechanism for real-time updates of that safe set using a control filter. So this is providing safety for the robotic task. It's important to note that that's not yet addressing the safety of the perception module. So we're assuming that we're getting, you know, we're interpreting those images real, uh, correctly from the perception module, but that's still, you know, one of the challenging open problems that we're working on. And so with that, I'd like to wrap up and thank um, uh, some of the students in my group um, and former students who have been instrumental in developing this uh, safe learning work. Thank you very much. Questions uh, for Claire? Yes. That was a really interesting talk. I was curious whether or not you've thought about computing reachability for biological systems. Um, like you could imagine modeling sort of biological processes or physiological processes and trying to get reachability in those cases um, and whether that might be relevant. Uh, we have done, um, not for skeletal and muscular systems, but we've done quite a bit of, without learning, um, reachability computations for um, problems in protein regulatory networks. We have a collaboration with um, um, uh, some molecular cell biologists as well at Stanford, as well as some um, uh, cancer biologists. So we're using this concept for analyzing biological circuits in that context. Thank you for your talk. So I have a question here uh, for the comparison between the end-to-end -end method and the uh, kind of optimal control method. So is, it, is a map somehow encoded uh, as part of the neural network? Because, so I was wondering if the end-to-end -end agent doesn't know anything about the map, then probably it is kind of asking too much to... No, neither, neither. Um so neither the control base or the end-to-end -end have a map yeah, of the but, environment. But if the agent knows nothing about the map, so how does it kind of do the planning? Yeah, it uh, just gets the next waypoint. So it's used to seeing, for example, it, it knows where it is, it knows where it wants to go in its own coordinates, um, and it's getting images, and it's seeing images, oh, that looks like a chair, or to, it looks like something that I'm going to have to go around. So that was, to be able to get that to work without a map, that was the work of the supervised learning. So doing the training of the neural net to be able to get good results like that was, um, so, so no map involved. In the, um, in the latter part of the talk where we do safety, we are, you know, within that field of view, we actually have to develop a depth map of what we see, you know, and that's standard. We're using the M part of the SLAM for doing that. But in that, um, in that first part where we're doing that perception, planning, and control, there's no map. And that's the point. I mean, I, I think maps are too heavy for a lot of these tasks that we want to do. And so that was really the point that we wanted to explore. The, just to follow up, the, the robot is localized. 
The robot is, yeah, so we have the inertials, and that's provided, as you saw, into the neural net. The robot knows its own position, and it knows its own inertials. There's a question up there. Uh, thank you, very interesting talk. Uh, I'm just wondering how much can you push this idea of training in simulation or training in Stanford and then moving it to Berkeley? Mm -hmm. And I'm more wondering from, um, you know, let's say from a theoretical point of view, what are the challenges that you see there in terms of providing some guarantees about this type of pipelines? I mean, that's the question. I, th that's the big open question. You don't have an answer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you for asking. It's. Uh, we had a lot of lessons learned, some of which I presented there. I mean, this isn't going to work now if we take it and put it in a completely different, like put it outdoors and trees and, you know, it's, it's really, um, it's, it, it, to be able to get it to work, you need, our experience is that you need to be training on data that are, you know, in some sense similar to what it's going to see. Uh, Samil, who developed this, has been working with Skydio. So Skydio is this amazing company. It fly, it's basically a flying camera, um, and they're a quadrotor with eight or ten cameras. Um, they started with, and, and they're flying, they're basically people like them because they track them while they're doing cool, cool sports activities. Um, but they started with a slam pipeline, and now, as they presented at ICRA last week, they've moved to a... Um, basically a convolutional neural net architecture. The ability, so I think, you know, on the flip side, the ability of this network to generalize to having little smudges on the lenses or little raindrops on the lenses or, you know, a branch or a wire or is, you know, we have to code all those things into a slam pipeline. You don't have to do that here. But how to be able to prove something about this using, for example, tools in verification of neural networks. We can't do that for this type of neural network yet, but we, we're working on that. I think that's the big open question here in this area. On that note, let's thank Claire uh, again. Thank you.